From 1967 through 1977, the Oakland Raiders won nine division titles, a Vince Lombardi trophy, and the reputation of being the most feared team in the NFL. But by the end of the 70s, the silver and black were in decline. After not making the playoffs in 1978 and 79, Oakland made wholesale changes to compete for a title in 1980. Still, most experts picked them to finish last in the AFC West. Even with 15 new players, the team retained the hallmarks of the Oakland Raiders. Veteran leadership, embodied by number 63 Gene Upshaw. Physical intensity, personified by rookie Matt Millen. And an unlikely reclamation project. In this case, a former number one pick whose career had hit rock bottom in 1978. Talk about low points, you know, here I was, a first round draft choice just seven years earlier, uh, you know, out of football. They talk about depression, I didn't know what to do with myself, maybe I should quit football altogether and go seek uh, employment elsewhere. It was a very, very difficult time in my life. We knew he had talent, we knew that he could play. I can remember him being a number one pick out of Stanford. The Raiders go back to New England to play him in his first game and he beats us. You know, I still felt, you know, I could play football, you know, even though I was down in the dumps and, and, and things weren't going well for me. And, and you know, all I needed to, is to be given another opportunity. Plunkett got an opportunity in Oakland, the league's island of lost souls. It's always uh, a group that's seen as a, a renegade group, uh, the halfway house of the NFL, uh, guys that didn't fit in anywhere else, and uh, they always seem to come to the Raiders and, and thrive. And it was a simple reason why it always seemed to work, because Al Davis always gave you a chance to be you. And we used to tell all the players, there ain't many stops after you leave here. Davis gave his new quarterback a simple message. You know, everywhere you've gone, you've, you know, you've been labeled as a savior. You know, you've been brought in to help turn this team around. Well, here, that's, you know, that's not the case. We want you to sit back, watch, and learn our offense, and just get yourself prepared. Entering the 1980 season, Plunkett was the Raiders' backup behind Dan Pastorini, a former Northern California high school rival, and the man selected two spots after Plunkett in the 1971 draft. I'd have just about had it, you know, two years on the bench. Uh, Stabler was gone. Uh, they were bringing in Pastorini, another strong-armed quarterback. He didn't like sitting on the bench. He wanted to get in and play. And it's no fun to come to practice every day, to work as hard as you work, and never get a chance to show it on Sunday and to help you win football games. One player expected to help Oakland win right away was Matt Millen. The Raiders selected the Penn State linebacker with their second-round pick. What did I know about the Oakland Raiders? Heck, not very much. I knew them by reputation. I knew they were kind of a rogue outfit. There was a sign that hung above our old locker room, and it said, the Raider rules. Raider rule number one, cheating is encouraged. Raider rule number two, see rule number one. Uh, it was something we said among ourselves when we would be out uh, away from the game. If we were playing golf, if we were playing shuffleboard, if whatever it w was going on, the old saying was, if you're not cheating, you're not trying. And you laughed about it. You laughed about it until you realized that what they're saying is, find a way to get it done. Find a way to get it done. If somebody holds you, how do you make them stop? You need to talk to the official, fine. If you need to grab him by the throat, great. If you need to punch him in the throat, whatever you need to do, get that done. Is that cheating? Well, you know, I read rule, read rule number one. It was, cheating was encouraged. Is that cheating? Actually, no, it isn't. I learned very early. Every game has its own set of rules, and every officiating crew calls them differently. Whatever those rules were that day, you learned them fast, and then you learn how to skirt them. Whether the Raiders cheated or not didn't matter. Few thought Oakland would win in 1980. I really didn't have very high expectations because the day I was drafted, I said, are they any good? And they said, nah, you guys aren't going to be very good this year. But in 1980, the only surprise bigger than the Oakland Raiders 
would be the man who wound up leading them back to the Super Bowl. A lineman in college, Matt Millen had six weeks of training camp to learn how to play middle linebacker. Right away, Millen made an impression. Matt Millen in training camp. That has to be an experience you could never forget because Matt Millen thought every day was game day. He thought every play was a game, and he thought they were voting for the Pro Bowl every time he walked on the field. The guy is coming in full speed. We don't even have pads on. He's coming in full speed, going right at Shell and myself. Says, What's wrong with this guy? Where did he come from? Art Shell and Gene Upshaw, as soon as I got there, they took me under their wing immediately. I was like their little puppy, probably. The guy was nuts, and he would have something called arm parties, where he would bring this bar into the room, and he and a couple of other guys would do curls at night until they couldn't lift their arms. He would do this all during training camp. And they would tell me, hey, you just be aggressive. You, you need to get that huddle straightened out over there. When I stepped into the huddle, they, uh, they listened to me, and they wanted me to. They wanted somebody to take over, so hey. I'll take over if nobody else is going to. Millen's ability to lead the defense faced an early obstacle. I was so proud to have a form-fitted mouthpiece. I brought it with me from Penn State, and it fit in there perfect. Ted Hendricks comes walking over to me, and he goes, you got that mouthpiece? And I go, yeah. He goes, is that one of those form-fit mouthpieces? And oh, yeah. It's a form fitter. I got it at Penn State. And he goes, let me see that thing. And I showed it to him, and he looked at it, and he went, and he threw it. <laughs> and he threw it and went flying. And I go, what are you doing? And he goes, I can't understand a damn thing you're saying. Don't wear any mouthpiece. Just yell it out. I go, okay. <laughs> it's into my form fitted mouthpiece. Known as kick him in the head Ted, Hendricks was a typical Oakland Raider. There were always guys who did crazy things, but they just fit right in. I mean, they might be crazy somewhere else, but they were not crazy for us. So many people dislike the Raiders. Why do they dislike the Raiders? Because you guys are different. What makes you different? How do you fit into this whole picture? What, you know, that's kind of a, when you say I epitomize the Raiders, uh, and then you say the Raiders aren't very well liked, I guess you're trying to say is that the Raiders, as well as uh, John Matuzak, have always been uh, controversial. John Matuzak. I didn't know anything about John Matuzak other than <clears throat> he was supposed to be nuts. And um, he didn't disappoint. <laughs> it's the closest thing to being uh, a lion or a cheetah or a hawk that there is. It's, it's, it's the most beautiful but the most brutal game in the world. Were they a bunch of guys who liked to have fun? Absolutely. They had fun off the field and they had fun on the field. But the part that's always missing is they worked. That was a, that was a hard working team. That was a group of guys who who wanted to get better. Oakland's head coach was Tom Flores, whose low-key approach was a calming influence on the Raiders. Tom's laid back, you know, he's a matter-of-fact kind of guy. Uh, he sits back, watches everything, uh, doesn't raise his voice very often. I think what Tom brought to the table was just that confidence, that quiet uh, approach to the game, and we wanted to play for him. When Tom Flores brought us out on the field, you wanted to win for Tom Flores. Flores' team opened the 1980 season with a new quarterback and six new starters on defense. It also had to contend with the scorching heat of Kansas City. It was brutal. It was probably 110 on the field. That was an AstroTurf field, and it was hot. It was almost unbearable. Burn the bottom of your feet. Uh, your feet would, you could feel literally almost being burned. In the middle of the third quarter, they had a beer commercial come on. And all you heard was across the whole stadium. And then you heard 
And everybody turned and looked up at the video board, and Ted Hendricks goes, They're killing me out here! They're killing me! Somebody get rid of that commercial! Millen was learning to raid her way, play hard, and have fun doing it. He began his NFL career by grabbing his first career interception. He also received a vital lesson in Raiders etiquette. Few things I remember about that game. It was my first game ever. The first thing was officiating. At Penn State, we were instructed to whenever you address an official, you say, excuse me, Mr. Official. And then you ask the question. Now let's fast forward to the Raiders in the first game. I didn't know officials knew that kind of language, and I didn't know you could address them that way. It was, I mean, I was literally in shock. Ted Hendricks started cussing out an official, and the official turned back and started cussing back at him, and I was like, whatever happened to, excuse me, Mr. Official? Pastorini threw for 317 yards and two touchdowns as Oakland beat Kansas City 27-14. The retooled Raiders played like a contender, but it would take six weeks and another quarterback before they would finally become one. During the season's first five weeks, Plunkett remained on the Oakland bench with no opportunity in sight. Oh, I was disappointed, you know, uh, but I still had a job to do. It's difficult to keep your edge, to keep uh, your timing, keep focused on the chance that you will get in. I was just hoping for, you know, an opportunity to arise. The Raiders' play added to Plunkett's frustration. Oakland split its first four games as they struggled to adapt to Pastorini at quarterback. Uh, Dan had the habit of hitting his hand with the ball before he threw it. You can actually hear the ball leave a quarterback's hand and all of that noise and all of that crowd, you can hear it. You know when the ball's out of his hand. Well, we would hear Dan sort of hit that ball with his, his left hand and we would think it's gone and he would still have it. Then there would be a sign. They beat the piss out of him. He would stand in there and he would see it coming and he would just throw it and he'd open himself up and got, he would get pounded. He comes back the next week and he did the same thing. And they got him and they broke him. In week five, Pastorini suffered a broken leg. Plunkett now had his chance. In his first substantial action of the season, Plunkett did little to help the Raiders. I hadn't played in almost two and a half years. Uh, I did throw a couple of touchdown passes, but threw quite a few interceptions. But, you know, we're behind. I'm trying to get back in the football game. I was disappointed. You know, I'd hoped to have played better right away, but uh, I didn't. The loss to Kansas City put Oakland's record at two and three. The Raiders were outwardly confident, but could see their season slipping away. Losing was not something you got used to in Oakland. Under no circumstance, we had gotten hammered, we had lost our quarterback, and we were now going into this unknown. But we also felt that together we still had enough talent to win this thing. With Pastorini out for the season, the team's hopes now teetered on the right shoulder of Jim Plunkett, a man who had never led a team to the playoffs, let alone the Super Bowl. But nobody had any doubts that Plunk could do it. I look back on it. When he ran onto the field, it was like, all right, Plunk will take over, we'll be fine. You know, I was a little apprehensive, but, you know, in the back of my mind, if I don't do well with this opportunity, you know, I might be out of football again. Once again, Al Davis told Plunkett that he was part of a team, not the focus of it. Uh, he came up to me Friday before the game in the locker room, said, you know, it's not important that you play well, it's important that we win. And I kept telling myself, stay in the pocket. You know, hold the ball to the last possible fraction of a second before you get rid of it. Don't look to run too soon. I mean, I'm telling myself mentally, this, these are the things I've got to do uh, in order to be successful. 
I tried to be conservative in one aspect, but I also was looking for my opportunities to throw the ball down the field. Plunkett revived the Raiders' offense. Plunkett will try to get him rolling from the 11. And off to King, outside left tackle into the secondary, takes off the 15, the 20, it's a good ready for the 30. Here comes Shaw, 40, 50. Shaw gets a piece of it, misses it to Cody, and then 20, and then 10. Touchdown Raiders! Holy Toledo! We take on the San Diego Chargers, who are acknowledged as the best and highest scoring team in the National Football League and we whipped them. And what comes with a good whipping for a team that's struggling is the great equalizer, confidence. And here I am as a young kid, and I'm looking around the room, and these guys are starting to believe that we have a chance. And so we finally start to show that we're starting to define ourselves. And Plunkett was the main cog. We had just beaten what we thought and what the league thought was the best, young, highest scoring team in the National Football League with Dan Fouts and crew. And now we're going to play the defending world champions on Monday night. And you know, with the Raiders, I learned fast. When the lights turn off, we turned on. There was a lot of electricity. We were back in the Steel City on a Monday night. The criminal element was still there. You, you had the Oakland Raiders and you had the Pittsburgh Steelers. We were down 20 to seven early in the ball game. Had a fight and claw our way back in. Certain down and distance situation, they went into a certain defense that allowed Cliff to be covered one on one as soon as I saw it. Uh, audible to it, and you know, there he goes for a long touchdown. We put a beating on Terry Bradshaw because we got after the passer. Willie Jones had a big night. We knocked, we knocked Bradshaw down. I can't tell you how many times Terry was laying on the ground and everybody was out. And I was talking to Jack Cam, and I go, "Geez, I hope he's all right." He said, "What are you kidding me? It's Monday Night Football. He knows there's good camera time." <laughs> I think that was the game where we knew that you know what, we got a chance because we just beat the defending Super Bowl champions in a game they needed to win on a Monday night in front of a national audience. Do you get confident because you're winning or do you start winning because you're confident? And it's something that I, I pray about now with my Detroit Lions because we need confidence. And that team found it. Behind Jim Plunkett, Oakland won six straight games. The man who was out of football just three seasons earlier was now the league's comeback story. It was a different area of the football team contributing to our victories week after week. You know, our defense for the first half of the season literally was giving up like 27, 28 points a game. And right after that Pittsburgh game, all of a sudden they cut that almost in half. There were no blowouts in that stretch, none whatsoever. And uh, it was amazing that that stretch lasts as long as it did. The great thing that happens with teams is you win and you don't feel good about it. I think that's the best thing in all of pro football, to win a game Know you won and you didn't play your best, because that's where you really get good. The Raiders took an 8-3 record into Philadelphia to take on the Eagles, the best team in the NFC. Well, I remember going into the vet, uh, as the vet is. And that place was a dump. They had seams in the AstroTurf. It was hard as a rock. It was bad, but when it was cold outside, it was even worse. It was a great game, and I remember the game was real physical. Defensive coordinator Charlie Sumner gave Millen special instructions for the Eagles' biggest weapon. Before the game, he said to me, listen, Harold Carmichael is six foot eight. 
the first time they run a deep end, you go hit him in the middle of the chest and don't worry about the flag. We'll handle the flag. So the first time he ran that deep end, ball was overthrown. I, I just tried to kill him. I tried to hit him as hard as I could. And I went to hit him and I caught half of him and half of our guy. And I think I hurt our guy. The Eagles didn't hurt Plunkett, they just pressured him all day. Uh, it was very inhospitable uh, to me in particular. Eight sacks, they could have had more sacks. Uh, you know, they stymied us. Bart Shell felt I was dropping back too far, so the cup wasn't defined as well because of where I was winding up. And I was probably doing that partly because of the rush and trying to get, give myself more time. There was a point in that game where we thought we had it won, and they came back and beat us. When Philly scores their touchdown. One of our linebackers has Jaworski in his grasp, and he ducks and he slides over the top, and, and Jaworski makes the play. So although we lost the football game, we went on the road in the cold against a good young team, and we're right there with them. I took out of that that we were in pretty good shape because if that's what the best the NFC had to handle, we'd be able to handle it. Well, if I was trying to sum the Oakland Raiders up in just a couple of words, uh, it would start with Al Davis. He is the Oakland Raiders. He is what the team is all about. He wanted to win as bad as anybody in the National Football League, if not worse. He had worn a lot of hats, being a commissioner, be, you know, being a head coach. Al Davis, above all else, he is football. He would come to practice, and he'd, and he'd mention things to you about a specific game or something of your game that you had to get better at. It was all X's and O's. Davis's combative style often put him at odds with the rest of the league. Ever since I joined the Raiders in 78, there was always some controversy surrounding the Raiders and Mr. Davis. And we took on his battles. He didn't want us to take on his battles from time to time. As much as he tried to keep them away from us, it just didn't work that, that easily. He just wanted us to play football. After failing to extend the Raiders' lease in Oakland, Davis began preliminary plans to move his team to Los Angeles for the 1981 season. And then he said to me, I am seriously thinking about moving to Los Angeles. And I said, well, if you are, if you decide you want to pursue it further, let me know, and I'll schedule a league meeting and it'll be reviewed. He said, if I decide to move, I do not intend to ask for a league vote. And I said that uh, clearly that was against the Constitution and that would put us on opposite sides. And it was Al Davis deciding that he felt that he should have a right, if his lease was up, to go to a better facility in another city. And he ended up uh, suing the NFL, and they spent several years in court. I think they're still in court. Uh, I felt strongly that Al was correct. I also felt strongly that the Coliseum were not up to the same standards um, as some of the fields in the National Football League. I've had three different owners, I've had the commissioner, I've had league officials come to me and say, if you stay in Oakland now, we'll get you whatever you want. But I made a commitment and it's too late. There will be representatives from 14 or 15 teams who are at that meeting whose story will sharply contradict the story Al Davis told today. Well, you the clear implication that, of what you're saying is that Al Davis lied under oath. I say it's up for the jury to draw their, draw their own inferences. But it got to be such a, a personal issue through all of that. He always tried to insulate the team from that. It didn't always happen that way. It was easy to say that, but it was not easy to live that because we felt that everything that we did, the penalties on the field, the rule changes, whatever, it was always about, let's get the Raiders. While Oakland fans rallied to save their team, the Raiders were racing toward the playoffs. Oakland won three of their last four to clinch their first playoff berth since 1977. Key to the Raiders' resurgence was the judge, cornerback Lester Hayes. 
Hayes, who tied an NFL record in 1980 with 13 interceptions, had four more called back because of penalty. Lester Hayes had a year in 1980 where that was arguably the greatest year a, a, a corner has ever had. He just took the game over. On the field, Hayes' play spoke volumes. Off the field, he struggled with a speech impediment. Seems like you have fantastic jumping ability. Uh, uh, what was he saying? Like, uh, what was on my, uh, what was he saying? Like, uh, 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 like, was in uh, like, high school, like I was, uh, like, I was a five foot 10 postman. Mm -hmm. And I was on a state championship. His team, stuttering. So, uh, Lester approached that problem the same way he did everything else. He attacked it straight on. And he didn't make you feel uncomfortable with it because he knew that you saw that he was struggling through a, a word or whatever it was. He knew that. And, but he just stayed with it. And he expected that you would stay with it too. Hayes worked tirelessly to improve his speech and used stickum to help his hands. Hayes put stickum everywhere and stuck to opposing receivers like glue. Stickum. Stickum is no longer allowed in the National Football League. <laughs> there were so many things that happened that year with his stickum. If you touched him, you would just stick. That's how he got all those interceptions. Raider rule number one, cheating is encouraged. So was it cheating? What Judge was doing was he was taking a rule and something that was allowed, and he was pushing it as far as it could go. You knew that if you need stick him during the game, you didn't have to go to the bench. As Les if Lester's on the field, you can just go to him. And I used to tell her, just stay away from me. You can imagine guys in a pile up, and all of a sudden they get out, and they got all of this stick em all over them, and that's the way Lester was every stinking play. We were playing the Houston Oilers, and they had a center by the name of Carl Mock. They're getting ready to kick a field goal. They're in the huddle. Judge comes walking out, takes a big hunk of stick em, walks by the ball, kind of nonchalantly slaps it on the ball and walks out. The Oilers come up and Carlos reaches down and grabs the ball right on the stick em. And, and his, the veins pop out of his neck. And he's like, stuttering son of a bitch, did something to the ball. And he's screaming at the officials and they're like, hey, hey, come on down, calm down. Well, we came off the ball. Carlos snapped it over his head. He snapped it over his head. And I always wondered how much the stickum had to do with that. In the wild card playoff game, Oakland sacked former Raider Ken Stabler seven times and cruised to a 27 to seven win. fourth quarter, the judge delivered his final verdict. The one step, and only give us the right to play next week, that's all. We got to do something about it. We got to do something about it next week. We got to go to work. One o'clock tomorrow. That's Everybody right. on right. time. Amen. Amen. You guys should have got assigned to the Atlanta game. It's only 50 degrees down there. Yeah, I'm trying to pick up. We had to go to Cleveland. And I can recall we we have to play this crazy game. I just just remember how cold it was. <laughs> Cold. It was freezing, and Dave Dalby, our center's out there in a t-shirt. Why, I'll never know. Listen up now. Hey, listen up. We're going to go regular and kick it right, and make sure with those heated benches over there, if you see anybody asleep, kick them in the ass. The ground was completely frozen. The showers didn't work. And that wind was ferocious coming off the lake. Maybe they were about between 80 and 90 passes thrown in that game. Very few were com completed against the win. Ron Bolton's interception return put Cleveland out front. The Raiders stayed with the Browns, 
and Mark Van Egan's touchdown with nine minutes left gave Oakland a two-point lead. They were known uh, through that whole period of two-minute offense, the cardiac kids, and here they come again. And they started marching down the field again. And all we could do is stand there. And the Raiders are in very, very difficult position. And I'm standing there thinking, we've come this far, we fought this hard, and I can tell you, I never felt so low in my life. They're going into the open end zone, where the dog pound was. We had already blocked one field goal going in there. And we look at their bench, and we keep thinking, they're going to kick, and that's going to be it, and we're going to lose, blah, blah, blah. Well, they go back for one more pass. I just could not believe it. I don't think anyone on our sideline could believe it. And I don't blame them, you know, the play call. I mean, that's, you know, you're taking a chance. Cockroft already missed two extra points. They're afraid he's going to miss a field goal. The ball on the 13-yard line of the Raiders, but with Cleveland needing only a field goal, the Browns appear to be in the driver's seat. They came out on the play, and nobody thought they were going to throw. Logan to the left, Rucker to the right. Sipe is going back to pass, wants to take a shot into the end zone. He looks, he throws, and it's a great play that may have been intercepted, and the Cleveland Browns call the football once too often. Holy Toledo, it was Mike Davis who made the big interception. Mad Dog didn't catch the ball very well. Could not catch a cold in Alaska barefooted. But he made a phenomenal catch. So you go from as low as you could possibly be and in one snap of the ball, you go to the height and as high as you could possibly be. Also, I could not believe that Mike Davis actually caught the ball because I'm telling you, he had absolutely the worst hands in that secondary. For the AFC Championship game, Oakland went from the Cleveland cold to the San Diego sun. We knew that going into the conference championship game, that we were going to be playing our old rivals. We knew it was going to be at their place, but we were destined. We thought we outplayed them the first time. We did outplay them the second time, so we approached the game with a lot of confidence. Against the NFL's highest scoring team, Plunkett went to the air early and led Oakland to a 28-7 first half lead. San Diego responded with 17 unanswered points. Entering the fourth quarter, Oakland was worried. And they're, getting, they're getting back in the ball game, and Ted Hendricks grabs somebody by the jersey, you know, and she starts shaking me. He says, keep scoring, we can't stop them. All we had to do was hold on to the ball, run out the clock, control it, and we're there. You know, we were just you know, minutes away from a Super Bowl. And for many of us, this, this is an opportunity we weren't going to let slip away. That game, though, in the end, when all was said and done, came down to our offensive line and Mark Van Eagle. Burgess Owens and I were standing on the sideline. And he'd say, how do we do? I said, we picked up six. Two more first downs. One more first down, and the game is ours. And he said, what happened? And I said, we're, we're going to the Super Bowl. And he was like, he was beside himself. The total resurgence of the silver and black. New Orleans, here come the Raiders. Oh, it's like any locker room with a big win. Up he was, you know, he was the philosopher. And, well, this was a lot sweeter because in 77, I guess everyone kind of expected us to go. This year, no one said we'd go. Kick them was matter of fact. Yeah, they, they got their, their game rolling. They had the momentum going with them, but uh, we did some changes in there and we shut them down and then let our offense take over and they had a magnificent game. There's some music on and guys were dancing and everybody's feeling pretty darn good about themselves. I'm proud of you. Who on? Get it. New Orleans, oh, here we go. New 
Marlins during Super Bowl week is filled with distractions. For the Oakland Raiders, it was business as usual, even if business as usual for John Matusak meant breaking curfew. Did John show up late? Yeah, he showed up late. Was he out in the town? Yeah, he was out in the town. He was going to do that regardless. If it was a regular season game, that's what he was going to do. Now, now this is a Super Bowl game, and everything's a lot different when it comes to Super Bowl. A lot of things tighten up. You know what I'm talking about? Things tighten up. Glutus Maximus tightens up. You can't even get a blade of grass up there. Some people. Matuzak was referring to Eagles coach Dick Vermeil. Vermeil publicly criticized Matuzak's off-field behavior and put strict team rules in effect. They could not go to Bourbon Street. They couldn't go into the French Quarter. They couldn't do anything. We also heard that there were curfews, and we also heard there were mandatory meetings at night. There was a tremendous amount of pressure on the Raiders because the Eagles were known for how they could not go and, and do things and have fun. And we felt we had the burden of all the other teams to knock them off that perch because if they had won, we all would have been doing that. Uh, you know, the first night, you know, as Tom, you know, gave us, a, you know, no curfew, I believe, and uh, let us go out and get it out of our system. But uh, quite a few of the guys that we had had large systems, and it took a, a few days to get it out of their systems. The first night of curfew, there's no Matuzak. He staggers on the bus as we're leaving to go to the press conference, and we asked Tuz, where have you been? He said, I was out, and he looked like it. And so we asked him, Tuz, after all of this discussion we had in practice, and we all decided it's time to get serious, we got work to do, this is a business trip, and you go out. His response was, I went out to make sure no one else was out there. That was what he said, and he sat down, and that was that. Tom Flores tolerated the late nights, as long as the Raiders performed at practice. Our practices down in New Orleans, they were brutal. They were brutal. And I happened to be one of the guys that got into a fight with uh, one of the defensive players because uh, I thought he was uh, going a little bit harder than he should be going. I got into a fight with Mickey Marvin. I tried to kill him. I, I head-butted him into oblivion. I was letting everything out. It felt so good to be on the field. By game day, not even world events could shake the Raiders' focus. We drove to the Superdome, and it was a big yellow ribbon around the Superdome. I'm like, what the heck is that on there for? They said, well, the hostages are free. I'm like, hostages? To, oh, that's right. There were some hostages. I was so focused on what was going on. I didn't, I didn't have a clue what was going on in the world. Some would listen to that and say, well, that's great concentration. And others would listen to that and say, the kid, the kid needs a little perspective. But we were there to play one more football game. And to go to that game and not to be prepared to play would have just been awful for what we had already accomplished. It wouldn't have meant anything. Super Sunday, what a day. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. It's like a dream come true. It's unbelievable. Yes, and we're going to win. We are going to win, no question. It was, it was a great feeling. I was so proud to run out there. It was kind of like a storybook finish all coming to a head. In some ways, the Super Bowl was anticlimactic because the best team in football, we thought, were the San Diego Chargers. We knew the Eagles had beat us. We knew we could beat them. We knew that if they came in the way that they came into that game we played them in the season, we could beat them. You know, I was ready once I stepped on that field. I, you know, I still had something to prove to myself and to whoever else. Plunkett on a straight drop back. Here comes the rush. Steps up. Can't find anybody yet. Tits off running to the left. Rolls on the move. And it's caught by Kick at the 40. Kick over the 50. Kick over the 50. Kick over the 50. To the 40. To the 10. To the 40. Touchdown Raiders. Plunkett's eating us alive. In just three months, Jim Plunkett had gone from Heisman bust to super savior. Three touchdown passes capped one of the greatest personal comebacks in NFL history.
Jim Plunkett had a masterful game. Rod Martin had a game for the ages. He was everywhere. He was everywhere. He had three interceptions. He wasn't Bobby Chandler. But with a little bit of stickum, he could hang on to the thing. That was probably compliments of the judge. He played as good a Super Bowl as any defender has ever played. Did not get the MVP. Jim Plunkett got the MVP. Jim deserved it, but Rod deserved it just as much. I felt really, really good for Jim because he had paid his dues, just like everyone else. But it meant a lot to him to be the guy that led us through that Super Bowl. It's a great feeling. Finally accomplished something that everybody who ever gets in the NFL wants to do. The only suspense that remained was whether the tension between Roselle and Davis would affect the presentation of the Vince Lombardi Trophy. Never will forget him telling us, we beat these guys, we go in that locker room, you be gentlemen, you show respect, and that's the way we will approach this. I think it's a great credit to you for putting this team together. You've earned it. Congratulations. Thanks very much, Commissioner. This was our finest hour. This was the finest hour in the history of the Oakland Raiders. To Tom Flores, the coaches, and the great athletes, you were magnificent out there today. I had a very surreal moment. We won the Super Bowl. We all flew out back to, to uh, Oakland. They were going to have a parade. I wanted to get home. I sat in my mom's living room, and I turned the news on, and there were my teammates having a parade. And I sat there and I thought, was I even there? Did you even play that game? Because it just, it didn't seem real. It just, everything happens so fast and you don't really appreciate it. I really think it should be mandatory for every team that wins the Super Bowl to take one day and just the team Nobody else, just the team, the players and the coaches, and go back to their facility, get a bunch of food, sit down, and watch the film together as a group so you can just enjoy what you just did. And I think if you did that, it would be awesome because that's the one time you don't have to worry about the next game. You don't have to worry about, you. hey, you did it. You finally did it. That's everything we planned on doing all the work that goes into it, all the sacrifice that goes into it, every, and just take one time to enjoy it. And I think that would be, that would be great. For additional video content, photo galleries, and more from America's Game, visit NFL.com slash America's Game. This NFL Films production has been brought to you by NFL Network. Watch the National Football League 24 hours a day on NFL Network.